What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Cashflow Empire every single Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time. And for those of y'all that are Eastern Time, I think it's about 8 o'clock right now, so welcome. Pacific is probably like 4 o'clock, but nonetheless, <laughs> welcome, whatever time zone you're in. You, um, We like to do these calls every single Tuesday night just to really uh, bring friends and family and, and partners to talk about real estate, to talk about the different types of situations, the different values we're able to bring to our community here at the Cash for Empire. And tonight we have the honor of having Dan. Dan, how do you say your last name? I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Prisonowski, and because it's basketball season, you can all call me Dan K. So I'd like to Dan chef. K. Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Once again, we really do appreciate you taking the time out of your night tonight to spend you know, a couple minutes with us and, and to hang out, man. So for, for everybody that doesn't know who you are, Dan, let us know who Dan is, Dan K. Dan K, great. And for those of us on the chat, let me just pop a few things in here so uh, so we got it so you can spell it so we're not taking all the time. But uh, yeah, Dan Krasinowski here uh, from Austin, Texas. Uh, I want to give a tremendous uh, oh, gratitude to Helen for kindly inviting me on. She's been great as a colleague with our real estate meetups. Uh, and as we say, if it's Tuesday, it's meetup. So uh, I love your guys Tuesday night. We have our lunch in Austin. So open invite for folks that come to uh, to Central Texas to hang out. Uh, you know, it's it's a great group on the call here. I see, you know, different uh, different backgrounds, different ages. Uh, and I think we all have these great sort of light bulb uh, moments. And, uh, you know, mine was being co-best man in a wedding. And, you know, playing the part, he seemed like a good guy. Uh, asked him what he did. He said he flipped houses. I said, all right. So what does that mean? He said 15%. I'm like, oh, very interesting at the time. And then he said, did you know you can use your retirement dollars? Uh, and for me, this was kind of the light bulb, you know, the seize party moment um, where your kind of gut feeling, your intuition becomes a reality. And I was very fortunate that uh, you know, these types of accounts and passive invest investing has been around. It just wasn't as publicized as maybe it's been, uh, you know, for the past 10 years or so. So that that's kind of a quick, and I'd love to, you know, as I get to know a lot of folks here offline with one-on-ones, uh, you know, love to hear your story, uh, kind of how this came through. And hopefully I can share a little bit. We're all in different stages of the journey. And um yeah, you know, as we get started, curious for folks that are online listening to live, how many folks would consider themselves um, a passive investor? And feel free to blow up the chat here if you want to also uh, see a lot of hands being raised, which is great. So, wow, boom, dropping the mic on me. All right, so we're going to get, we're going to go, whoa, boy. All right, here it comes, here it comes. All right, so here we go. Um, who is, and I know the title here, who is a cash flow? But then who also is a growth investor or are folks both? So are we looking at cash flow income? Are we looking at development growth? Are we looking at both? Wow, I got my work cut out for me tonight. This is a, I'm gonna have to tag somebody in here. All right, so here we go. Here's the ringer, third, third time's a charm. Um, are you guys investing with your cash, your liquid accounts or your retirement, such as a self-directed IRA or solo 401k? slick awesome so you know i i see a lot of cash which is great which is how most folks do get in i see a few people commenting both uh not many self-directed exclusives here and there's a whole lot that go into it that uh i know this is a very sophisticated crowd here but that you could take advantage of i think by knowing kind of the ins and outs of everything here so you know with that uh i just want to take kind of a little step back so how how i did get into this uh, outside of, you know, the kind wedding story here was, uh, like many of us, uh, I'm a Gen Xer, you know, a little bit of gray hair from the little hair I got up here. And, uh, you know, it was go to work, max out. Uh, you know, I think our situation is going to be very similar. I, you know, my, we have a seven-year-old, so we're going through odd numbers and even numbers. So uh, for us, particularly whose parents were, I'll call it an even generation. What do I mean by that? Uh, if you've been in the States, love it, the shout out to Gen X. Um, if you've been in the States for a while, 
uh, and your grandparents grew up through the Great Depression, guess what? They were entrepreneurs. No ifs, ands, or buts to survive. You were an entrepreneur. You were alternative. You thought outside the box. That's how you got by. Um, if your parents particularly grew up as a boomer here, guess what? Most likely, not as likely to be an entrepreneur. This is where you go to your job, you do your nine to five, you max out, not even a 401k, I'd say kind of your pension. And then 401ks came and you're very dependent uh, on everything kind of flowing how it does. And, you know, if you retire probably by 2008, life was good and it's a relatively easy flow. But for a lot of folks, um, younger boomers or some other Gen Xers, it really wasn't the case. So, you know, with that, uh, my math is simple, graduating undergrad in 2000 with uh, continuing the corporate route. Uh, and then, but always said an inkling that there was something just a little bit more out there. And, uh, you know, for me, it was sitting at a kind of a dark, dreary November afternoon uh, up in Stanford, Connecticut, looking at logging into my Fidelity account and thinking, wow, why is my retirement in the year 2050, you know, Fidelity fund? And uh, from that point, uh, started doing a little bit of research. Uh, Learned about some alts. Uh, I assume a lot of folks here are, are familiar with the concept of crowdfunding and stuff. But even before the Jobs Act and such, uh, I was a very fortunate to uh, move to Austin, kind of beat the crowd by a decade or so. Uh, learned that you can invest in various structures, uh, some which I would definitely not recommend, like a multi-member LLC, uh, to invest passively bars, restaurants. Uh, are these great investments? Generally speaking, no, it's a tougher risk return profile, but it could be a lot of fun. You're young, you're single, or you're not single, you at least don't have kids yet. Uh, you know, you're out and about, uh, you get other ancillary benefits here head to toe. So this is what I took advantage of, uh, which I call in the, in the old Austin here. Uh, and then, you know, found myself of all things at a self-storage company. Uh, the first aggregator, the hotels.com of self-storage, which was a really, really cool experience, uh, company Sparefoot, which has been quite successful since here in Austin. And, you know, the benefit here, as they say, riches in the niches, uh, I was able to really get a lot of great one-on-one -on -one time with folks that are still known in the storage industry as the top operators, top marketers, uh, and I learned everything from, you know, physical occupancy, economic occupancy, and then, turning it around, recognizing that it's still, um, there's a few corporates, but it's a very diversified group of operators. And a lot of them need it, you know, half a million, a million dollars per facility uh, when they wanted to acquire. So for me, this was kind of a another eye-opening experience. And then it really came down to a question of funding, kind of how to go about it, where are you liquid? And I think the challenge that some of us have at different multiple stages of life is, and I look back at the chat, there's a lot of, you know, cash investors, but over time, you know, what pockets of money can you go in and out of? Uh, and for me, it was just a gold mine and very fortunate to have this large retirement account, uh, relatively speaking, that I can tap into and be diversified. Uh, and this is everywhere from single digit checks in the thousands to, you know, much larger checks to get out here. So, you know, just for our folks that are live with us, kind of going back to the chat, love to hear what sort of asset classes you guys, what was your initial investment in? Uh, I didn't share mine yet, but I want to see if anybody has anything nice and fun here. What was the first passive investment check that you wrote? Okay, we got some restaurants. Uh, that was my second one. So good play. Got some single family. Come on, guys! Don't be shy. And uh, SF, <laughs> Jimmy, don't use. I, I got it. So, all right. Uh, I'm telling you, you're either. Gonna, I see some ha ha. So you know, Jimmy's kind of. I think he's on to me a little bit here. Uh, very cool. Well, I'm gonna play on Jimmy with the ha ha and say, uh, my first investment passively was a comedy tour. So. <laughs> ha -ha. especially if you want to have a nice tax write-off at the end of the year. So for my Dallas boys here, I remember sitting uh, with my wife. Uh, it was a Middle Eastern comedy tour. It was a great show and saying, sweet, I hope you like these because these are uh, 
thousand dollar seats if this doesn't go well. And uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, we, we tried to put it on DVD and sell it, but that I guess we missed the boat there a little bit um, amongst many other things. So uh, I guess a good lesson learned from kind of what's experiential and what's, um, you know, physical, what's tangible, like a house. But once again, this was just a great investment and I think a great way to get in. And, you know, fast forward, I, I imagine a lot of us here on the call, as we're learning, uh, and so many of you, you know, I kind of know just by profile, you're probably a mentor to a number of folks, uh, which is cool, which is fantastic. And the nice thing is the folks, our mentees, our children, uh, you know, folks that might not be at the income level that we're at yet, have a great opportunity now to do sort of these, I'd say, um, smaller checks. You never want to lose money per se to learn, but you know, to get these real world MBAs at a much lower dollar amount. Uh, I, I think crowdfunding is, is a great way to go about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, this was the wild west. Uh, you know, this is how we, uh, this is how you invest it. So we had a comedy tour go down the drain, uh, a bunch of funds with the restaurants, uh, a cafe, you name it. Uh, but it was a really good way to start thinking from bucketizing too. So, you know, come tax time, uh, I know for a lot of our cash investors here, sometimes the loss is nice, you know, to kind of offset. So I took advantage of, uh, you know, some not so favorable K-1s early on and then, you know, shifted to more favorable. Uh, but, you know, the big thing for me has been tapping into um, not only my retirement, not only the self-directed IRA, uh, but particularly here, the solo 401k. Uh I'm going to go back to the chat. Who here has a solo 401k? It's okay to say no. Got it. Yeah, Raul, props. Um, so let me do a follow-up before I get hit with all these no's here. Uh, who is self-employed? Who is a realtor? Who does, I'm <laughs> not old enough, I love it. Um, who does some consulting on the side? I'm expecting to see some yeses here. Yeah, who's a realtor? Who who gets a 1099 miss, you know, at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. We're seeing it all. We're seeing the positives now. Yeah, folks. So, you know, I mean, with this uh, and making great use of our time here, uh, I think the solo 401k is something definitely to kind of be considered, not just for you, but for your audience. Uh let me give you some kind of figures. A lot of folks know about, hey, it's IRA time and I can contribute. It used to be 6,000, 6,500, now 7,000. Uh, the magic number in 2024 is going to be $69,000. Kind of wild, right? What you can contribute for your husband, wife team, multiply that by two. Should you happen to be over 50 years old, add another 7,500 in catch up contributions. So, uh, you have to make the money. You can't just magically put it out there, but this could be an actual uh, true watershed moment where you can have tax deferred money going in to be a passive investor. So if we get anything out of, you know, this call, uh, one thing I would share kind of in big and bold is uh, if you want to take advantage, if you're having a good year as a realtor, being self-employed, uh, now is you need to open the solo 401k by year end. So just want to be kind of pretty open about that. Uh, if not, you wait till January 2nd, tough cookies, you're gonna to have to wait for your 2024 earnings, which is generally different than a lot of sort of tax accounts where come March, come April, you can still contribute to the the prior year here. So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into detail to promote. These are just folks that I personally have had accounts with or folks I know here locally in Austin um, with some codes. So I'm just going to uh, pop this in here, you know, in the chat, feel free to take advantage as you'd like. Uh, Hey, Dad. So, yes, sir. I got a quick question for you. <clears throat> so it, 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 you will have the chance to start all over again, right? Because, you know, I feel really related with you uh, when you mentioned that you invest in, in restaurants. And that's actually one of my first uh, passive investment. Uh, and when you say that it's a risky investment, actually it was. <laughs> because huh? at the end, uh, that money didn't, didn't go well at the end. So what is great, because uh, I always take everything with like a like a lesson right lesson learned sure. so if you would have this chance to start all over again uh how would you start building that confidence and and that kind of like ladder to, to start climbing and building your passive income yeah great great question uh 
you know, I, I would start local. You know, the easy answer for me, and, and I think the common answer the last few years was to just go on a crowdfunding, do a thousand dollar, a five thousand dollar, a ten thousand dollar check, a twenty five k check. Um, that's nice, but it's almost like investing in a stock. You're not really going to know the people. You're not going to have that one on one interaction with the manager. Uh, so yes, you could get a financial gain if the deal goes well, but it's not great from a, a learning perspective. I think the way to go about it is, uh, you know, and I'll look at what Helen and I do here in Austin. We get to physically talk to folks on a weekly basis. Uh, a lot of their deals are within a drive, sometimes a 10 minute drive, sometimes a one hour drive, very open to go boots on the ground. Uh, to see the property, uh, you know, to sit here with our laptops open, say, hey, here's kind of what I'm seeing. So that's a huge opportunity that you're not going to get being a very, very small dollar and maybe uh, a more national fund. And, you know, Jonathan, just another point here, I like to draw, I guess, another big takeaway here. And this is me talking personally, not Dan, the licensed guy, but I like to draw a triangle uh, when I think of who I'm investing with. You know, the top part is your very savvy marketers. Uh, I, I won't name any personally, but I know in recent years, these are the folks that have raised, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars from a lot of first time investors. Uh, and frankly, many of them are pausing distributions and or doing capital calls. So, you know, in the spirit of musical chairs, the music has slowed down a little bit from the days of two years ago. Uh, and a lot of folks that were first time passive investors uh, have a pretty tough taste in their mouth. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing that I'd say, don't, don't follow. Um, if you're hearing a lot about somebody and they don't have the track record yet either be, be very cautious. Or if somebody is pitching you and they're not, they don't have personal skin in the game, they haven't invested. Uh, it seems like they're brokering 10 different sponsors. I'd be very cautious on that. Uh, I always like the bottom of the triangle. Who is your solid operator? Who's your gritty sticks and bricks operator? I know a lot of you know you guys have got gals got your hands dirty on deals. That that's trusted experience here. And then the other side, which you have to be aware of, is on the financing side. Uh, how is it structured? Is it a K one? Is it a ten ninety nine? Uh, when you see something like return of capital, what does that mean? Uh, the whole return of versus on, but even of could have different meanings. Um, based on physical return versus something on a tax form. So uh, there's a lot of things that I always try to make it very simple. I think the question is to say, hey, Mr. or Ms. Sponsor, if I give you, let's fast forward a few hundred dollars on January 1st, how does this play out on your base case scenario? How does it play out on your worst case scenario when you get bought out at 90 cents on the dollar versus a full dollar? So I, I think if a sponsor should be able to in relatively simple terms in a very, I'll call it human cash on cash perspective, say your dollar in, here's how it's going to look on the way out in terms of hard cash. And then also taking it a step further based on different tax uh, strategies, kind of what your net return is going to be. So I would say keep it very, very local. Um, if you do have the benefit to go to uh, belong a community like left field investors, uh, I think that's a great one. I'll try to put that in the chat later. Uh, there is some more local that sort of meetups. I think that's another good way to have a, a, you know, more from an LP to LP perspective, minus the sponsor giving influence to choose who you're going to go on. And then a final point is if you do have niche expertise, I mean, for me personally, it was self-storage, uh, right place, right time about a decade ago. And, uh, you know, both my pre-tax traditional money, my cash, my retirement on the Roth side all benefited because I was around this niche in my nine to five. So I, I think Jonathan, great question once again, but that's how I'd really look to say, here's kind of my first check uh, from a learning perspective. Then I have a question. Sure. So uh, when you're talking about, um, when you're looking for deals right now, I mean, as an LP, how do you evaluate a deal? What are the top three criteria you're looking for? Yeah. Uh, if I don't know the sponsor and I'm coming in pretty pretty blind to it, uh, at this point, as I said, I draw the triangle and say, why am I attracted to this sponsor? Um, does he or she have a rags to riches story? Have I been to three conferences and they've been the major sponsor? Uh, 
you know, I've always been a little hesitant, but especially in this market, it's almost uh, hearing about somebody too much, it could be too good to be true. So I think that's a pretty fair sort of sniff test to do right now. Uh, I said the second one is just, as I mentioned before, kind of the dollar in sort of test or if I invest $100, how does that look? And if if that cannot be, you know, stated back to me in a very, very simple way that if I had my seven-year-old son or, you know, 70-something-year-old mother invest with me, they would fully understand it. Uh, then I'm going to be a little cautious there. And then the next thing I think comes down to, uh, it, it comes down somewhat to, I'll say the macro, but it's more of the micro. I know, uh, you know, if you have the benefit to do the one, three, five mile circle around the area, if you're physically there, if not the similar to say, uh, you know, for example, why am I still bullish on secondary markets in Texas? Well, folks are leaving the big cities, not just New York and California, but they want to leave Austin city limits. They might want to get out of Houston. So there's different cities that are attractive and the data backs that up. So I think that's a pretty fair way. And then, you know, if you really want to get in the weeds, uh, I think having a mentor on the LP side is very helpful. Uh, there's a fair amount of folks that are standing up their own uh, in lieu of being licensed or being a GP, they're standing up their own fund of funds, or I'll call like SPV in a box, uh, special purpose vehicle. So this might even be a great example. Uh, you know, Jimmy, you're an influencer, you have 10 of your buddies, and you're going to do the heavy work for them uh, on a diligent side. And, you know, you will be effectively uh, compensated. There will be a delta between the A share and call it the B share, uh, say for your aggregate million dollar check versus 10 of your buddies doing hundred K each. So that's another way. If you are the relatively on the small side, I, I think there are some legitimate sort of fund of funds of folks that, uh, but same deal. They can't just be kind of brokering or have an inkling. They should be very boots on the ground, very, you know, integrated in, in kind of the work there that they're doing. So, uh, you know, if you are kind of scheduled constrained a little bit, I would definitely rely on some of these folks. It's much like, you know, these, I would consider some of them, um, uh, uh, the experts, much like when you need a doctor, a CPA, or otherwise, I, I think that's a pretty good way to go. Uh, and then finally, you know, from the type of deal also, if you could, uh, if a sponsor can prove themselves sooner than later, I think that's a great point. I, I feel a lot of sponsors and my initial checks uh, were folks that had an equity component and a cash flow component. And what they did, they said, you know, you can put 10,000 in each. And it was great because after a few months, that cash flow thing was pain, which gave me confidence to say in a potential second deal, uh, I feel comfortable, maybe not even just putting my retirement, but my Roth retirement. Because I feel not only am I going to get the principal back or the deal's going well, I'm also going to get ongoing cash flow that I can then reinvest and it can compound. So I, I think that's uh you know, we can keep on going down the line how to do it. But initially, I think those are four or five of the, uh, you know, to do's that I would consider. A final thing here, uh, I'm just popping TribeVest. I think they're a great shop. If you are looking to lead a kind of a fund of funds or SPV in the box, and I'm happy to introduce to any of the, any of the companies I'm putting in the chat here, just let me know offline. Uh, but another thing, Jeremy Roll, uh, I'm sure some of you saw the notes, Charlie Munger, who was kind of Warren Buffett's number two, just passed today at the uh, you know young age of 99 and 11 months. Uh, so he almost hit 100 years old. But, uh, you know, he had a lot of sort of great sayings that that really went back to kind of the core of the company, the core of, of the management team here. And, you know, once again, in that spirit, uh, there's a gentleman, Jeremy Roll, who I consider the Warren Buffett of our space, of our passive world. Uh, he's been doing this for over 20 years. And, you know, what he shared, I think this is dynamite advice, would be to go to the sponsor, whether you're investing 10K or a million, to say, hey, folks, uh, what, what should I know about you before running a background check? And I think you're going to get two answers. Somebody's going to tell you a story or two. And you know, it, we all go through a bit of a gray area, but, you know, usually if you're on the up and up, you make it through and that's the way it's proven out or they're not going to respond at all. And I think that's your answer to probably not invest with them going forward. So I think that's another one from a, if you do feel relatively time constrained, small, uh, maybe not as extroverted, not as litigious, I think that's a really good upfront question to 
you know, almost like an initial screen of what sponsors you may consider to go with and which ones you won't. Uh, and, and, you know, a super final point on that, if you really say, well, you know, I'm considering 10 or I want to go hot and heavy on a few, or maybe you inherit some money. Uh, I think meeting with them, um, I love meeting off off hours. Uh, you know, you never want to get your your family and kids involved in business, but if it's a natural setting like a weekend and, you know, you're visiting with your family and you can sneak out for a half hour early and they're taking their child for, you know, 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. coffee for those of us with younger children, I think that's really telling too. I mean, that really shows the human side that somebody is showing, uh, you know, very strong character if you were to say that, I don't expect my family to know everything that I do from a business perspective, but from a character perspective, if I promise something or if I say, here's how I'm going to do it, um, I'm going to honor that commitment. So I, I think nowadays, uh, you know, for us as LPs, it's uh, it's an investor's market. Two years ago, I think it was more of a sponsor's market. Now it's an investor's market. And uh, so, yeah, great question. Thanks, Jimmy. That was a really, that was a really good answer, man. And, once again, Jimmy, that was that was a great question. And just kind of speaking about what are the type of things you're looking for in an investment, you know, it, it kind of leads up to the to the next question is, is what industries are you personally investing in? And what do you like and what don't you like about them? Yeah, I love it. Um, so I will always love self storage. And frankly, it's because Americans, we, we love our stuff um, and we have a lot of it. Uh, you know, uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that is behind, but, you know, there, there, you can Google this all over. They talk about the four D's, uh, you know, the most common, of course, death, divorce, uh, you know, I know layoffs are not a D, but uh, there's dissociation and such. And then I, I think the fifth D that really came out of COVID was decluttering, where legitimately, you know, you can't find a third bedroom or you, you don't have the budget for an extra grand a month or two grand with your mortgage for that extra bedroom, but you need that space. Um, and at the same time, you don't want to feel cluttered, especially for our friends here from the Northeast. Uh, you know, you want to have that ability to have open space, have a hundred, you know, photos of Austin on the wall behind me and not feel it's like you're stuck in a, somebody's closet here. And so, you know, with that, uh, I think there's always a need and enough, even younger, uh, you know, Gen Z have touch storage, even if it's five roommates together at college. So it's becoming literally, uh, you know, for us, we had, a as our son kind of went from baby toddler to older, we got rid of all that stuff and our storage facility was open. Well, we forgot, you know, what was once his toy room previously was a pantry and all of that. So you kind of go through some of these steps uh, and you realize that, having this extra space off site that you can go to every three months, every four months really, uh, you know, opens up your space, both figuratively, you know, literally. Uh, so storage, I love storage is great. Uh, uh you know, second one, uh, industrial, uh, I think industrial industrial is the everything else category. You know, we can go on the street, ask somebody what's a hotel, what's retail, what's multifamily industrial is a tough one to describe. It's the everything else. And if the country keeps on flowing, at least for us for here in Texas, if the boats come to the port, if the military stuff moves, goods comes through Mexico and Latin America, there's going to be a need for certain types of industrial, uh, particularly on the warehouse, the last mile industrial, kind of in the spirit of an Amazon. So I like that. And then, listen, I, I mean, for folks that are at a stage where you are going to rent or you previously were a homeowner, maybe you're moving from Brooklyn, you're brownstone, you don't know Texas yet. Uh I think having some sizzle with a uh, brand new multifamily is awesome. It's just like having the potential to move into a brand new house with, you know, the one, two, 10 year warranties and, uh, you know, something as simple as a few pickleball courts. I think it's a whole lot of pizzazz these days, um, having plugs for Tesla's and EV vehicles. That's tremendously huge. And so I still think right now, uh, you know, a lot of cities don't want to deal with a lot of developers, uh, particularly in the, you know, the smile part, the bottom of the country, uh, energy rights, the ability to get water kind of on a, in perpetuity, those days are uh, limited. Um, and just, it's not as common for 24 seven access as a developer. So I think with that, I think there's going to be certain development projects where much like a wine, you're going to have certain years in the mid 2020s where, you know, normally when 10 properties should have come on, let's say maybe only two will come on. 
Uh, and if you have the new shiny property, that's going to help on the rent side to get leased up. And then finally, on the back end, uh, for more of the institutions out there that are pensions that tend to buy stabilized, they're still going to want to buy product. I, I don't think they can sit on the sidelines forever, and they do like the benefits of real estate. So I think kind of looking backwards from the, you know, who's going to buy. And a final point, since we are talking about the niches, um, this whole 1031 Delaware statutory trust world, I think, is great for particularly a boomer that has owned properties forever they no longer want to say deal with tenants. So the 1031 is not an option, but maybe they want to keep 100% of their principal. So paying taxes is not, a, not an option. So the only option in the middle here is the Delaware Statutory Trust. So I think there's other niches that are going to become more popular. And DSTs, no surprise, tend to be tied to very, you know, nice, stabilized, multifamily, uh, certain medical facilities. Triple Net Industrial has been a great one. Uh, I, you know, the only change I see there is, I think the blanket statement was, uh, you know, on the retail side for a Walgreens, some of these pharmacies were thought of as, you know, AAA never going anywhere. And as we've seen in recent months, that's not the case anymore. So, you know, once again, it kind of, you bring it back to a hyper location and maybe, you know, blindly investing where a big corporate's a AAA, maybe that's not, you know, the best move these days. So. That is good. That is good. Thank you, Dan, man, for, for, for sharing all of that. And uh, do you have any uh, percentage wise about how you distribute your, I will say, more risky investment, less risky investment, or a mix of both? Or or uh, can you walk me through that? If, yeah, absolutely. If that's your case. Yeah, and let's think of it from an indexing perspective. And, uh, you know, I've heard this at family office shows. And just, you know, the reason why we all love real estate, I mean, in an open forum, very wealthy families and folks with generational wealth are very open to say, you know, 90% of my stuff is in alts. It's in private real estate. It's in non-traded. So I feel all of us on the call, we're, we're in a pretty good spot here uh, to focus on that. So much like, and I imagine there's a few poker players at the table here, you know, on the screen uh, is that think of it in terms of chips, poker chips. So, uh, and when I say one, you know, your one can be 1000, you know, for maybe, who knows, maybe we have some trust fund kids or somebody representing family office here that might be a million. So think of it in terms of indexing terms between one and a hundred. Uh, but, you know, Jonathan, what I look at here is that, you know, if, if it's almost like a buddy startup or somebody you want to support, but you're going to support as an investor or you get other ancillary benefits from this investment, you know, almost in the tune of what a crowdfunding check would be. I think that's sort of your lowest, um, you know, sort of check. On the flip side, you know, a sponsor, and I'll go back to, you know, the gentleman who I met way back when over a decade ago, I think over the years, I've written him 30 checks, he's never missed on a payment. So, you know, once again, from an indexing standpoint, it's very easy for me to go with my, my you know, gold chip, my largest one there. So, you know, that said, uh, majority of my retirement is in real estate. It's probably... I'll call it uh, a third, a third, a third. And what do I mean by that? Um, a third is development, you know, where there's not going to be a payoff for three to four years, probably. Uh, the other one is very uh, prescriptive short term, uh, maybe call it where it's nine month loans, but the sponsor can roll for another two, nine months. And the other one is going to be your typical mix, kind of what we all got to know and love over the years of value add, where you do get that quarterly cash flow and a bump. So all in. You know, maybe a third or half is what you're going to get in cash flow and the rest is what you're going to get on the back end, a kind of level setting, maybe 50 50. So, you know, for me, that's worked. Uh, it's also been enough cash flow that, uh, you know, I've been able to reinvest with the same sponsor with with different sponsors if I wanted to try out. And uh, that's been that's been helpful. I think from an allocation going forward, I like that. Uh, my mind's pretty simple in terms of think of what our parents or grandparents maybe would have done with certificates of deposit with CDs. I think that's a good play. And a big final point, um, and I know, I know we're not doing slides and such, but I'd say a good third takeaway. Um, I feel if you just draw, you know, basic X, Y axis, we're back at a 45 degree angle from a risk return profile. What do I mean by that? A few years ago, the debt side or for you investing in debt only was probably low single digits. The banks didn't pay much CDs, you know, a lot of bonds were even in the red and then an LP deal and value add, you'd get 20 something IRR. 
that's kind of a weird sort of hockey stick when you really think about it. Nowadays, I think we're back where, you know, your cash gets four to five percent. A senior lender maybe gets eight percent. Um, certain type of mez with accredited investors, small mom and pops are in that 10, 12. Uh, you know, private equity, secondary debt's a bit of a wild west. Uh, and then you get your GP stuff, you know, value add maybe in the mid teens to high teens and then development if it goes well. Uh, you know, a 20 plus sort of IRR. So I think from a, a risk return, and obviously every deal is going to be different, but we're moving back towards, I think, a normal sort of, um, you know, once again, sort of risk return profile as an investor. So, you know, to your question, from a return standpoint, and I view it from generally returns and timing, uh, that I am kind of within each of those third buckets there. And, uh, you know, for me, that works for other folks. If you're in different life situations, you know, the obvious caution is you don't know when something is going to exit. So I may be uh, a little heavier on something that uh, cash flows monthly, or if you think of a typical stack uh, on a deal, you know, maybe you're above the GPLP stack and below the senior debt, maybe there's like a promissory note or a pref equity in there. Uh, I know that's becoming kind of the hot stuff with kind of the new age of crowdfunding and otherwise kind of the middle of the capital stack that, uh, you know, obviously do your diligence and such, but that's a decent way, I think, also to to get cash flow. Uh, but, you know, I still feel cautiously optimistic that we're going to see some trades next year and post-presidential election. Uh, and a final point, just kind of in the macro, uh, you know, especially for some of the younger folks on here, I think we're in from an interest rate side. The, people are saying this is the new normal. This is actually the old normal, which is, was normal and is normal again with the last 10 or 15 years, a bit of an anomaly um, to be at zero for kind of so long. So I actually think personally, we're in a pretty healthy where the base rate, you know, where they look at so for otherwise is kind of over time, I think will stay in the four to seven range. You know, I think we're in a pretty good place and, you know, folks, some people are going to take it on the chin with some other deals, but now going forward, um, I think this year we would have saw a few more transactions if it wasn't for Silicon Valley Bank and a few other things kind of in March and April. So we've, we're out of that. Once again, I'm cautiously optimistic when the calendar turns, um, you know, that, that we do see some turns. I know a lot of folks want to reinvest. They want to go with other sponsors or double down on a sponsor they trust, but they're waiting on those funds to come in. So I, I think, uh, you know, once again, uh, I think next year, we'll start seeing some movement. And um, so that's just me as a passive investor too. But, you know, final point, just of caution, be careful how much money is out there that especially is not paying cash flow because it could be an extra year or two, particularly if you need it for your livelihood or spouse is retiring or otherwise. That's awesome. Thank you, Dan. And again, it's about doing your due diligence, right? Because I'm sure before you invested in something, you kind of sort of understanding how is that it works, right? So you, you educate yourself, right? To be putting your best in something. Is that correct? I do. And, you know, is it to the extent that, like any of us, I mean, you never want to get to analysis paralysis. And some of it is, uh, and I always get this analogy, you know, you bet on the jockey, not the horse or, you know, whoever you trust, which more kind of the human side of it. And uh, that's it. It's kind of like your poker chips. You're at a different table. You might think, you know, blackjack, but this one's a little bit different, you know. Uh, and if you can start off small and, you know, see something tangible, uh, some sort of tangible return or uh, them honoring their commitment or their style. I think that's great. So, uh, you know, th there is definitely benefit being, a, you know, at times kind of a direct investor, uh, you know, with a sponsor that you might want to get in bed with uh, a bit further. That's good. That's good. Okay. We have Helen. Hey, Helen, how are you doing? And thank you again, Helen, for, for this connection. Actually, Helen brought uh, Dan to this conversation tonight. So so thanks again, Helen. <laughs> but go ahead, Helen. That's your question. No, thank you to Dan to be here. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. I just would like to ask two questions. Um, one is about what are the most common mistakes that you have seen that the people, the new investors do so that way we can avoid them. And also um, if there is any book that have been helping you in this journey. So which one will be or, or a couple of books that have been helping me. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do the easy question first. Uh, you know, what to the mistakes I, I think is, uh, 
you know, not having, uh, not having a list, a, a diligence list. And listen, you don't need a hundred items, especially on some of your initial deals. But uh, as I referenced Jeremy Roll, the Warren Buffett of our space, he started with a top, with a 10 list. I think he's up to now, he gets a PPM and says, here's a hundred things I want to talk about. But he has that right. He's been around the block a little bit. Uh, I think from a diligence standpoint, uh, and just to reiterate, you know, from a, just be point blank, hey, if I do a background search and if people are, if they're shady, they're probably going to pull back and not answer you. That's a really good one up front to get to. Uh, I think references are kind of good to a point. And I think folks that asked wisely, it's not just a general reference, but more, uh, you know, I mean, who's local or if I'm a doctor, who's a fellow doctor or, you know, who else has used their retirement or you talk about this magical K1, uh, you know, with this depreciation thing I never heard of. Well, you know, who else can you show me a mock one? You know, so I think there's different questions to kind of play out based on somebody's sort of marketing uh, that I go through, you know, other mistakes. And I go back for folks that join the call late. I just draw a pyramid and, uh, you know, the bottom is the boring, I call it. It's the good, the good underwriting and the good operations. The top is kind of the sizzly marketer. And, you know, once again, not, not to name names, but there's some folks that, you know, I mean, just, just search who were headliners and speakers at Best Ever Conference and a few other ones in recent years who frankly might have their LinkedIn wiped clean right now and their social media wiped clean. So I think from that standpoint there, uh, you know, you really have to question somebody or somebody that got to a billion dollars. Was it truly organic? with a small team or do they have kind of a network of people kind of brokering their deals that, you know, are savvy enough to get maybe a million or two each and all of these add up over time, but that doesn't necessarily make them great deals. Um, and frankly, in that you have very limited power when you're one of potentially a thousand or 10,000 investors in something versus more part of a smaller group where you can have that intimate knowledge. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, the COVID days are over wherever you are in the country. Don't just chase you know, a beautiful face like here on the screen and say, okay, yeah, here we go. Here's a, here's, here's a ticket. So, um, on the, on the book side uh, and should have come a little more prepared. Uh, I'm going to reference back. So with left field, I'm going to reference more of a community, something like a left field investors uh, I think is good to get into because uh you, you do have the ability to, you know, once again, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with up to, you know, a thousand fellow LPs, not all at once, but one a week, but more so it's kind of an internal, I'll call it, think like almost, it's not, it's not the most tech savvy, but, you know, think of like almost like a Craigslist, but old school sort of, um, not as much chat room, but a very thoughtful post on a topic, whether it's something going on in the Mac or maybe even down to a particular sponsor or a particular deal. Uh, I think that is... That's wildly powerful. Um, and if we were at my house right now, I point to a bunch of books. I my uh, my fault is not being able to rip a few off. And of course, I can say rich dad poor dad all that. But there's others that have been much more um, impactful for me. And it's usually you know once again, um, if you go to some of these shows, the sponsor, and frankly, their book doesn't have to be about real estate, although it is helpful if it is. But when they're telling their story or um, even if it's very fictional, it's going to tell you a lot about that person and if it resonates kind of with you. And I, I think that's, um, and it's, you know, for those that have written a book or anything, it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort. So uh, I will have a thing, um, Helen, I'll let you know, and maybe at the next week or following week, you can just add it in, but I owe you an answer to that. So I'll keep everybody in suspense for a, a week or two. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Okay. Before I let uh, Jimmy go with the next question i have a maybe this a little bit more personal question uh for you then tonight is like how you ever lost money in any investment if the answer is yes how do you overcome this challenge right because this is actually the fear of many people actually lose money uh, yeah it happens um and it sucks um it definitely happens and uh you know why is that i, I think you have to realize at some point there's two things. There's a gut feel. So there's a very, very uh, intangible. And at the same time, as I go back, let's call it a top 10 list, a very, your diligence list of top 10 items, no matter what you have to go through. Uh, and if you don't honor that, you're going to get crushed. So uh, a, real, a real example, uh, and this was really early in my journey, uh, we 
you know, for those of us that are in Austin, the Arboretum area, uh, relatively well off, there was a property, it was a flip uh, right next to a golf course. To me, it almost looked done. Like this was a no brainer. I had a friend, uh, she was a CPA, uh, very financially conservative, introduced me to this gentleman. Uh, I think we were seven months pregnant. He, you know, it was a hard money loan at the end. The rate seemed reasonable, nothing too high, maybe call it 15% at the time or so. And I said, oh yeah, this is great. And, you know, our son was born fast forward. He wasn't done. He needed another three months. Yeah, that's no problem. Then it was like, oh boy, how come this isn't done here? And this is kind of, uh, you know, it was uh, it was an issue, which once again, if I had my checklist, not to fault this gentleman, but he was the only one there. So besides, you know, the whole getting hit by the bus potential, he didn't have any support. And I think that was for me in hindsight, you know, you do at least want another warm body somehow attached to the operation. So that was the one. Um, the second thing that I learned in different states, uh, there's different, uh, I put this, you know, government entities that once your loan is defaulted upon that you have to report to. And in some states, it's very chronological, meaning, you know, Helen could be before me for a million dollars, but I put my, you know, submission in before her and I had a bunch of late fees and everything. I can, outside of the first lien senior lender, I might be able to step in front of her, which personally I think is very unfair, but I got caught in that situation. Uh, you know, I might've got with a little less sleep, a little too greedy with, you know, I'd say what were reasonable late fees, but feel like they were pack packing up. So very long story short, uh, my Thanksgiving, uh, and this was the last Thanksgiving my dad was alive too. It just sucked. You know, I was in Pennsylvania, it was cold, it was rainy. I was trying to figure out all this on the fly to not lose everything. Uh, at the end of the day, I got 70 cents back on the dollar, which I think is a relatively good win. It wasn't a full goose egg, but, uh, you know, very fortunate. It took a lot of time and energy um, to get there. And in some ways, it was helpful that there was only three or four of us that were not the first lien versus maybe 100 or else it could have been tough cookies. So, you know, for me, that was a... a you really have to be hyper, hyper protective. It's kind of like uh, parents and I'll commend the mothers out here where you're just hyper protective of your child. I think you have to be that as an investor here when you're going and especially the first time you're investing with somebody. I think if you don't, it's kind of a disservice to you or, you know, the pool of money um, that it's for, you know, so uh, yeah, kind of honor your, your, it doesn't have to be big, but you know, your, your five things or 10 things that you need to be a green light, um, you know, really honor that. That was great, Dan. That was great. Yeah, no, I had that question in mind because, you know, again, at the beginning, I always have that, you know, mindset. I want to put the money to work for me and everything, right? But uh, sometimes I got too excited, right? And I was probably not doing my my whole homework like you did, right? So <laughs> that's key when you share that, man. One other thing, too, you know, for our kind of CFOs and controllers on the call, sorry, because this is not another you know, administrative headache. But the first time I invest, um, I like to go old school and do a paper check. And there's two instances, one, and I feel I've been pretty decent, you know, knock on wood that, uh, you know, things are going to flow as they're supposed to. But, you know, one gentleman, once again, not to name names, but uh, got to be very well known in our world in recent years. Uh, this was not his first deal. He was around real estate for a while before. Uh, when he cashed the check, it was in his personal name. You know, it wasn't like going straight to the deal. It was a little bit odd. Um, but the check cashed. Everything worked out for a while. That was, a, that was one. But a second one, another time I met this person, uh, you know, we had a great lunch. I was really supportive of him personally, everything else. I think he was legitimately good hearted. Uh, he just got in over his skis. I, I think he had different funds, different things. And I think he viewed it more as an investor versus like, these were very strict legal entities. So I wrote him a check and he calls me. He's like, Dan, I can't do it. I'm like, oh, okay. You know, what do you mean? Fund date, you know, or whatever fund they run. He's like, no, man, I, I just, I, I can't do it anymore. I'm like, okay. And he had the checks like, you know, you want me to tear it up or, you know, shred it, whatever. And, you know, we, we just said, sure, we did that. And a few weeks later, uh, you know, he just called the SEC. He just said, listen, guys, I, here's what happened. Uh, I, you know, uh, and, you know, I want to own up to it, which I commend him for doing that. Um, but I also commend him in the near term. Whereas if I were to have wired him money the first time, 
Uh, and I understand there is huge benefits of wiring money also from a security standpoint. So I'm not saying that, but kind of from an initial standpoint, uh, this was just a unique life point that I think he would have other things on his mind just, you know, versus like, oh, here's Dan's first check that got wired and how do we get it back to him? So uh, it's a little thing, but I've noticed that. And I, I think it's a very fair point. Um at the same time, it also says a lot about the sponsor. You know, it's kind of like the date versus marriage. How do they treat you before? And then once your check's out there, you know, what is the process? So if you do have that ability also to come in small uh, and then say, listen, if things look pretty good and smells right, you know, I'm going to add a zero or five X or whatever it is. Uh, once again, I think there's some leverage that, you know, as an investor, you, you may have these days. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, and, and Dan, you know, I know that you have been uh, in, in the industry of, you know, passive investment for a while, right? Uh, and a lot of people, uh, and you heard this all the time, right? Uh, there are some posts in social media or, you know, on the news or something about getting rich quick, right? Yeah. So just coming from the from the passive investment side, you know, where, where you are an expert in this area. So what, what do you think about that? Because, so again, some people just think like, you know, they, they're going to get rich quick, right? So so what are your thoughts about it? Uh, as a passive investor, you know, frankly, that's, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, and I'd be very, uh, especially if somebody is trying to raise money telling you that, I mean, uh, no, <laughs> you know, as a best, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a get rich quick. Now, listen, can you ride a wave uh, when everything, when rates and market and everything else is in your favor and get some IRRs in the 30s? Yeah, you, you could. Um, but generally speaking, no. And, and there is, you know, I'm sure all of us have been paying like, hey, I need a short term loan and I'm going to pay 100% because, you know, this is a this is a unicorn sort of project or whatever. Uh, I... I I don't see that. A, I don't see that happening. One, and I rarely see the loan get paid back. So, A, I don't really fully suggest that. But, you know, if you do think, well, what's my collateral? What else am I getting out of that? Uh, you know, a, a high interest loan, let's call it, that I was a part of, there was, um, you know, a type of coin kind of in the spirit of a Bitcoin attached to it. You know, if not, I would not have made something where it just seems too good to be true. So, no, I, I, I'd be very hesitant Um could it happen? Yes. Is it less likely? Yes. You know, where do the multiples come from that do this? Frankly, it's not real estate. It's in the startup world, but boy, I mean, that has been marketed. It is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and it is almost a, a wave of luck uh, where you, you know, find the next Facebook. And just a final point, you know, I know we're talking real estate, but from the startup world, particularly if a company you know, is kind of mid, for those of us that know the startup world, you know, they're around series B, series C, series D, and folks are coming to you, you know, effectively where mom and pop's on the call. Um, that means probably a hundred VCs said no. There's probably a good reason why they said no. So I don't think it's a get rich quick. Do I feel you can get um, very comfortable cash flow over time? Uh, absolutely. Do I feel you get, you know, your gross and your more so your net return is better than being in, uh, you know, a, a 1099 high interest savings account? Sure, absolutely. I, so I, I do think there is a lot of net benefits. Um, you know, frankly, being a passive investor as a business, there's a lot of write offs. We all order pizza here, you know, we should be writing that off. It's um, so I, I do think there's benefits. Um, that over time you can achieve uh, achieve comfort and based on your lifestyle. But no, um, I, I think that's a, uh, and, you know, same deal too. When folks say the words like guaranteed or no risk or no risk on the equity side, there's always risk. I mean, there's definitely, and um, you know, so, you know, just be, be very cautious and diligent. Um, you know, as I said, kind of where your chips are, what the risk return is. And, uh, you know, I would even say do some math for a worst case scenario. If your development deals get delayed an extra so many years, if your cash flow deals only pay half, uh, can you still kind of manage what you need to do for the respective bucket of money? And thanks for uh, answering that question. I think that's very relatable to a lot of people. And on another side, um, 
for people that are new to the, this industry. And two, two questions. First part is for people that don't have enough money. They feel like they don't have money to invest right now. What's the, what should they do at this point, in your opinion? And the second uh, question is, how, do you, how much important do you think uh, for education is? You know, do you put a lot of uh, you know, investment in yourself for education on this uh, industry? Yeah, let's let's hit the second one first. Um, you know, I, I keep on referring like a left field investors. I, I think it's good to be in a community of folks that have been around the block, whether, you know, we'll pick on the the doctor avatar. If you doctor and you're going from your 100 hour weeks and you're going to start stepping down, you probably want to talk to a doctor that's five years ahead of you on the passive investing journey. Uh, you know, if you want to get some diligence on a bunch of sponsors, be part of a, an investor community uh, that you can kind of read up that they have, these sponsors have come in with their deal webinars, what lunch and learns, et cetera, that folks say smarter, but, you know, more experienced than you have asked certain questions. Uh, I think from a podcast, like anything, it's like, just like the news today, you don't just go all in on one or one side. I think tracking to a few different podcasts, um, I keep on referring back to the left field investor community because I do feel a really good agnostic community of LPs and sponsors and kind of just for the betterment of transparency of the community that, you know, that I do recommend. Uh, I think it's free to sign up and the paid membership is very nominal. Maybe it's a hundred or 200 a year. So well worth the education, um, you know, from that standpoint. So wholeheartedly, uh, you know, recommend that from an education standpoint. Um, and then in terms of the dollars, like, this is a unique sort of point. So this is where I go back to buckets of money. Um, you know, and I've met some engineers, they're very honest and they make, you know, 185 a year. So not 200 to be accredited, um, but they're taking, uh, should know stuff off my head. I think it's 65, 66, taking one of the series exams to be accredited because why? And we'll stereotype a little bit here. The engineer is going in deep, doing the research, doing the diligence for a very relatively small check on a 506B offering where they're not accredited and they have the one-on-one -on -one, or they want to be accredited because they're really um, kind of in love with the sponsor. So that's one way to do it. Um, you know, if just, let's say, you know, uh, my, my, my parents were in education and social work, it's not really big money makers, but you do spend the time, um, you know, if you want to go to the credit sponsors only, you have to be accredited uh, 506C, if not, uh, you know, if you trust a sponsor with a 506B, that's one way. I think otherwise now, you know, I still think you try to want to be somewhat local or have touch points with the sponsor, but there are still the equivalent of um, somebody like a tribe vest. Uh, you know, I said, maybe here on the call, 10 of you want to put $10,000 each in it with a sponsor because the minimum is a hundred. You can go through a tribe vest. I call it, they kind of take care for a cost, nominal costs, you know, the K ones and all that good stuff in between. So that's another way to stand it up and just a quick 30 second story on tribe vest. What it was, it was four brothers that needed to hit the minimum, but they invested as one entity. So, you know, over time, this has became a, the business model. So I think that's the way to, to go about. And then if not, uh, you know, there's different stages you're going back to school or otherwise, I think just two final points on this. One is that, you know, find somebody that will be an open book to you. You know, anybody here in Austin, for me, I can sit down and say, hey, here's what I'm looking at. Here's what I'm doing. Uh, you know, having that trust. Of, so you're kind of living a little vicariously through this person. But, uh, you know, there's there's that sort of benefit. And then finally, from a bucket of money, all else equal, assuming I'll just assume everybody's middle age and has some money in their 401k, you know, uh, it's probably not the best idea to be, you know, in a target date fund or all stocks or all bonds. Some part of that could be in real estate. And this is where you kind of flip to the self-directed world, the solo 401k self-directed IRA. And as a sponsor, you know, we assume you're at least a sophisticated investor and uh, you're going to invest in alts and you're probably not going to touch the money till you're at least, you know, 59 and a half anyway. So it's a good bucket of money to put to you. So that's the final thing too, I'd say. Uh, you know, particularly everybody I see who's, you know, has street cred. Um, sometimes the sponsor says, Hey, you know, the minimum was a hundred, but I have a final 18,000 on this deal. You know, we've been friends for a while. You've been asking me questions. Do you want to get in? 
you might say, great, I have 23,000 in this Roth IRA. Let me move it to a self-directed and go from here. So uh, anyways, that's just, a, that's just a thought. Awesome, awesome. Okay, okay. It seems like uh, we have uh, another question for Gabriel. Hi, Gabby, how are you? Thank you for being here tonight. Hey, Dan, thank you for the knowledge. I really appreciate it. Got it. So what has been your biggest life lesson uh, to this journey? And what would you have changed? Yes. Um, I think the life lesson is what I share when somebody says, you know, when's the first time you lost money? Uh, that was, that's a real lesson. You know, that's real stuff that when you go from no child to child, not just, you know, half joking, a lot of diapers, but more, oh, that could have been like the kickoff of the 529 or otherwise, like it's extremely tangible. So uh, you know, for me, that was a very, uh, you know, a very real sort of lesson. And then I think the other thing here is that, and you'll hear this is that, um, and I get it, the media makes out, you know, you're down to your last dollar and you have success stories, et cetera. But uh, I would say really have your base. And that can mean a lot for a lot of folks. I mean, that could, for some people, that means, you know, I have four kids and I want them to have at least a hundred K and all their 529s. And my house paid off completely and everything else. And then I'll go where other folks, um, you know, I have a buddy, he's never going to, he's going to live in New York city, not forever, but till his kid is out of school till he's 60. And then he's going to buy a horse track in Saratoga. He's never going to buy a house. That's not that important to him. So we can have his money to use otherwise. Um, so I think from a situational standpoint is having your kind of footing, and this depends on personal risk return, um, I think that's, and I think we all get this a little bit more post COVID, but, you know, being owning something physical, tangible, that regardless of whatever happens with paper money in terms of inflation or, you know, who knows what, uh, you know, I still think the laws of the land, especially in the United States, you know, there's generally one owner per deed or mortgage, you know, versus some other countries where it can get a little, uh, you know, a little suspect. Uh, yeah, I think being grounded and kind of knowing before you write your first check, where do you have to be? Because trust me, if it's not now in three months, six months, there'll be more than enough deals out there. There'll be more than enough sponsors that want to engage with you. So um, yeah, Gabrielle, thank you. That was a dynamite question. Really appreciate it. That's amazing. Thank you, Gabby. Good, good question. Okay, guys. So I think I wish pass a little bit over the hour, but it was an amazing call. Uh, again, Dan, Thank you so much, man, for being here. And uh, you guys stay there because we have the breakout rooms. Um, for everybody, thank you so much, guys. So again, uh, for being here, uh, the Tuesday call, the cash flow in Paris. So I'll see everybody next week.